prioritizing God's word. Thank you for being willing to read this morning. I just love to hear the scriptures being read. And as we have gathered this morning, if you don't have a Bible, if someone ever comes with you and they don't have a Bible, those Bibles that are in the underneath of the chairs, those are to be given away. When they get low in supply, we purchase more. That's our gift. We want everyone to have a copy of the Word of God. If, they, you know, if there's someone you know and you want to take them a Bible, uh, that's what it's there for is to be distributed, to be given out, not just to hold a chair down through the week, okay? So uh, feel the liberty to take one, to give one away. Uh, we're so fortunate. I don't know if we realize it or not how fortunate we are to have the Word of God in our language. There are languages that people still do not have, the Word of God in their language, and translators are working to get those, uh, the Scripture into their language. Usually they begin with the New Testament, they start there, then they begin the work of the Old Testament uh, to, to put a copy of the Word of God in every person's language. Last week we saw in Acts chapter 6 how Stephen in chapter 7, he masterfully used the word of God. You remember, Stephen was just an ordinary man, but that man was filled with the word of God. Filled, he was full of faith, full of the spirit. His life was marked by faithful and effective and fruitful ministry. And you remember when the apostles were brought with that complaint, they had an option. We'll go meet everybody's needs or we will put people in place in ministry and we will devote ourselves, Acts 6 verse 4 says, to prayer and the ministry of the word. And because of men like Stephen that served in that first band of seven and they took care of the needs of those women, and I will just mention Terry's right here, Kathy is right there, they are heading up an opportunity for us, uh, it's going to be in October, and there's going to be a yard sale, a garage sale, but it's really just in the fellowship hall out there, but um, to bring items Thursday, Friday, Saturday, there will be a sale. All of those resources that come in will go to the Yazidi women through Light of Life Ministry. So if you're like, you know what, I'm scarred by the last yard sale I had, here's a check, that's fine too. If you want to help, if you want to do, your kids want to do a lemonade stand, if your kids want to save coins, and you think of another idea to put this all together, we will put this into the hands of Irfan with light of light, and uh, we'll bless them in this ministry. Stephen was part of that ministering to the needs of the widows, the Hellenistic widows. And because he was effective in ministry, the apostles were effective in the ministry of prayer and the ministry of the Word of God. And we saw this last week that Stephen took the whole Old Testament and he pointed his hearers to Jesus. Just an ordinary person filled with the Spirit of God and he pointed his hearers to Jesus and one of his hearers was Saul of Tarsus, who later came to faith in Christ. The Bible is 66 books, okay? The whole message of the Bible is how God will redeem his people through Jesus Messiah. Old Testament, New Testament, 66 books written by about 40 different authors, different continents, over a period of about 1,500 years all inspired by the Spirit of God to give us what we have in our hands today, a copy of the Word of God. It's been our custom over the years that every time that I would finish, and generally what we have done is we'll study a New Testament book and then an Old Testament book and a New Testament book, and then an Old Testament book. We've, we've gone back and forth. At times, we might take, like we did Isaiah chapter 6, and we did one chapter in Isaiah, the glory of God. But when we're in between studies, and this has been a transition, an unusual year for us, uh, with transitioning to eldership, so we've taken time specifically to look at what does God say, how do we obey this, but as we prepare for our next study, I believe we'll be studying uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians. We take and we stop. We say, why do we do this? Is this just 
you know, something that is neat, but what is the understanding? Why do we take whole books of the Bible, start at the beginning with an introduction, take it all the way to the end, and I, if I was to try to sit here and think of all of the books that we've been through in the last 13 years, I wouldn't remember probably half of them. I have them all written down and put into files and all of my sermons this way. But some of our people have taken notes for all of these years and you have, you've received understanding of book by book as we've studied these. Let's just take a moment and let's listen, and it will, some of these scriptures will come on the screen. What does God say about his word? I'm reading right now, just came through Jeremiah, reading with a couple other guys, Steve Aiken and uh, Steve, Stephen Demzich. And we just came through Jeremiah, and this was so, it's so fresh on my heart and on my mind. In Jeremiah 15, verse 16, the prophet says this. He says, your words were found... And I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Now, if that was the only verse we knew about Jeremiah's ministry, we would say, isn't that amazing? I bet you he had a great ministry because he loved the word. I'm sure he loved God and people. And he loved and he was so hungry for the word of God. Well, he wanted to quit. He was rejected by the people, the children of Israel. He wanted to quit. In Jeremiah 20 and verse 9, he says, If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, he got to the point where he's like, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm not going to prepare another sermon. I'm not going to go talk to them again. They don't like me. They're complaining about what I say. They're maligning me. They're calling me a liar. He says this, there is in my heart, as it were, a, a burning fire shut up in my bones and I am weary with holding it in. And you know what? I cannot. The word of God in him, he got to the point where he's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do this anymore. And it just welled up in him to where he said, I can't stop. I have to let this word out. Jeremiah 23, 29. This is what the Lord says about his word. Is not my word like a fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. It's like a fire. It's like a hammer that breaks the rock. Isaiah gives to us what God says about his words and how man's thoughts and words are lesser. God's thoughts, God's words are always greater. And this is, I want you to have the understanding when you listen to a sermon, am I receiving man's thoughts or God's thoughts? Is this all about the man speaking and, and everything about him and what he thinks? Or is this what God has said? Is this what is true? Isaiah 55, 8 says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. And then this is what it says, Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Our words can't do that. God's word, he says, when my word goes out, and you thought that was the worst lesson I ever taught, and I've had messages that I thought were the worst messages ever preached. But God says, but was it my word? Were you faithful to my word Give it to me. And as it goes out, just like the farmer sows the seed and he doesn't see where all it would go, in Jesus' day, they would just cast it. Now it's all technical science. You know, they have it GPS guided in these, these planting machines that cost more than most people's houses. But they would cast the seed and God is the one that gives the increase. Now there are some churches that are shying away and turning away from the Old Testament. 
I heard someone say this, that, that, that someone spoke in a pulpit and was afterwards confronted by the people in leadership in that church and said, you know, you referenced the Old Testament. We're not going for that. That's just not who we are. The Old Testament gives us the whole backdrop. This is, this is not isolated. Eh, people won't understand the Old Testament. It's a wrong I th thinking that, well, the God of the Old Testament was wrongly said. He was angry. And we like Jesus in the New Testament. That's a confusion. It's a fog. It's a cloud of, okay, like it can't make sense of that. Listen to what Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says long ago. At many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. What is that? That's the Old Testament. He spoke to us, to our fathers, by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Through his word. Remember, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke and it happened. His word creates both uh, or all three of uh, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew 24, 25, Mark 13, 31, Luke 21, 33. All three of them record Jesus saying, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, read it with me, will not pass away. Will not pass away. You think about all that we engage in, all that we read, all that we see, all that we consume. What can we say that we partake of that doesn't pass away? The word of God. So after Jesus' resurrection, he walked with those disciples on the road to Emmaus. He unfolded the scriptures to them. Then he presented himself alive to the disciples. Luke 24, verses 44 through 48. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in, and here's where Jesus breaks down the Old Testament, in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. He divides up the way the Hebrews did the Old Testament into these three parts. He's saying the whole Old Testament must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the whole Bible. It's all pointing to Jesus. Revelation 1.3, you think about this as you're here this morning. And the word of God tells us, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. There's a blessing to simply take the word of God and swallow the nervousness, and swallow the pride, well, I might say a word wrong, and read the word of God. There's a blessing there. Blessed are the ones who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear you say, well, I was too shy. I couldn't read this morning. Hey, you heard the word of God read this morning. Hey, there's a blessing for those who read the words of this. There's a blessing for those who hear. But look at this now. Don't, don't miss this point. And those who keep what is written in it. For the time is near. So there's a blessing in reading the word of God. So we prioritize a place in every service of reading the word of God for hearing the word of God. But if this is our aim to keep it, to obey the word of God. And the Lord blesses this. We'll take a close word, look this morning at some of Paul's final words. As he speaks and he writes this letter to Timothy, he writes, he's coming to the end of his life when someone comes to the end of their life, you know, their words, they carry a great significance, don't they? I think of people that I've ministered to. I think of my own family members. And when it comes for their time to die and you think about those final conversations, they have a way of imprinting on your heart. You remember what they said. You remember 
how they said what they said. And as Paul writes to Timothy, and he's contrasting in these last days in 2 Timothy th chapter 3 and, and the whole resume of what is our news media, our newspapers, all of our outlets, all social media, it's described in 3, 1 to 9. It's right there. And here's the man of God. And here's where Paul, he, he, he says, but you, Timothy, you, you've got to stand out. But you, however... Okay, so there's a, there's a change. You, in a, 2 Timothy 3.10, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at List, and at Lystra. Those are all recorded in, in the book of Acts. Which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord Jesus rescued me. Verse 12, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, there's a contrast here again. Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. You might underline those two words right there. The sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture. Maybe your translation says every scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. This morning, why? I want to answer, give two answers to this question. Why should we prioritize God's word in our lives? We could ask this of our church. We could say this about our families. Why, would we, why should we prioritize God's word in my life? Why should I prioritize God's word in my family? Why should we prioritize God's word in our church? I'm going to give two answers to this this morning, and I believe they come right here from Paul to Timothy. Number one, because God's word defines and delivers us. That demands that I prioritize the Word of God in my life. God's Word defines who I am, who we are, what our lives are supposed to be about, and God's Word delivers us. The Word of God is the standard that transforms us by the power of the Holy Spirit from the inside out. I want you to think about this. It's the Word of God. The Word of God is the standard that transforms us by the power of the Holy Spirit from the inside out. Religion tries to tr change people from the outside in. Here's what you need to wear. Here's where you need to go. Here's what you need to do. Here's how many times uh, you need to pray each day. Here's how many times you need to fast. Here's the, how much you need to give. Here's uh, all the ways that you should serve. And if you don't do that, you're just not, you're just not up there with the rest of them. God's Word is a completely different approach. It changes us from the inside out by the power of the Holy Spirit. And where do we see this? We see this by Paul writing to Timothy, and he's just appealing, Timothy, you know me. You know me well. Paul's life was radically changed by Scripture. You see, he grew up in Judaism. He learned and he studied the sacred writings, the Old Testament. He heard it all. He thought he knew it all. He thought he kept it all until he heard Stephen preaching and he came to a right interpretation of the scripture that the whole Old Testament was pointing to Jesus and Stephen in his dying moment pointed him to Jesus, emulated Jesus, died forgiving like Jesus, praying like Jesus, so the scripture changed Stephen and planted the seed in Saul and he, he was radically changed when it went from head knowledge. Oh, I know the whole Old Testament. 
Much of it is memorized. To rightly interpreting and understanding the word of God, seeing the whole Old Testament as Saul would have become Paul. And then when he read Isaiah 52 and 53 and said, how did I miss this my whole, my whole life? How could I miss that this is not Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified, buried, and rose again? How did I miss that? Have you ever thought that? Where you read a scripture or you heard a sermon and you look at it and like, how did I miss that for all those years? How did that go undetected in me? How did I not see that? You know it wasn't just added, right? This, you know, this week uh, there was an extra verse put in. No, it's been there, but God opens your understanding and Paul appeals to Timothy, you have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. Do you see this is internal and external? This is fruit of the Spirit. Timothy, you know me. He's appealing. And, and after all, Paul is the one who met Jesus, the living word, on the road to Damascus. Changed his life completely. Not only that, but Timothy's life. It was immersed in the Scripture, the sacred writings. Hieros Grammata. That's the, that, these are these holy Scriptures, these holy writings he was immersed in them from his youth, his whole upbringing. And then he was discipled by the Apostle Paul. This letter is like that baton being passed to the next generation where Paul is preparing to die and he's saying, you know me, you've traveled with me, you know what everything about my life and you, young man, you were brought up in the scriptures. 2 Timothy 1.5 tells us that, that his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois, they brought him up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. When Paul finally uh, meets him there and he's, uh, Timothy's commended in Acts 16, they, they say this, that he was well spoken of by the brothers. The church knew that Paul had a need for someone to go with him, and they said, we know who needs to go with you. Take Timothy. He's well spoken of. We commend him to you. He will help you. He knows his Bible. He'll be faithful. He's teachable. He'll not quit on you. So take Timothy with you. The brothers spoke well of him. He knew what persecutions Paul went through. He knew what he was signing up for. And yet he also knew that the Lord Jesus delivered Paul from all of those trials and he's still alive and writing him this letter and he's not saying, hey, don't go in the ministry, Timothy. It's too hard. I mean, it's just horrible. I've been shipwrecked and, you know, and, and Paul wasn't the guy that every time you get around him, oh, check this thing on my back. Was that thing healed? Oh, and over here and oh, there's this time. And he, he wasn't that guy. But when it comes to ministry, he's reminding Timothy of the reality of persecution. He's not bait and switch mode here. He's like, oh, it'll be great, and you'll be fulfilled, and you'll have your best life now, Timothy. Hey, I just got arrested. Ha <laughs> ha, just kidding. No, Timothy knew better than that. He knew Paul, and he knew that the Lord Jesus rescued him. What about us? Verse 12, that's a word for us. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be hashtag blessed, bigger, better, more, persecuted. The day and age we live in, Paul is saying to Timothy, hey, evil people, imposters, you got to understand this. He wasn't telling Timothy this so that Timothy would know something about some other church somewhere else. Paul has to tell Timothy this because, Timothy, there will be people that you love and you worship with and you have uh, passed the faith on to and they're your spiritual children in the faith and they will fall under the category of imposter. They're not undetected by God, but young man, they will be undetected by you until they, until they bear their teeth. And it didn't surprise the Lord. And it will hurt you, but it ought not surprise you and bring you to the point of despair. It will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. 
knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you, have, you, childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's the point of Scripture, to make you wise, to make others wise, taking this word of God. I love to get a hold of somebody's Bible. Sometimes um, I've been at funerals, and they say, hey, this was our, this was our grandfather's Bible. And I've seen all different types. And I've seen some Bibles where not a marking on it. But you know the Bible that I love to see? I love to see the Bible that there's all types of writing, all types of highlighting, all types of this is where the person's learning this. And this promise stood out here. And that Bible is just, here's a prayer, here's a praise. And all of these things, I think it was Spurgeon that visited someone and they were reading out of uh, her Bible in her, in her senior years. And he asked that question, there's a T and there's a P. He saw the P, you know, what's that for? Well, that's for promise. Oh, what's the T and the P for when they be written in long in the Bible? Tried and proven. He's like, ooh, that's good. Write that down, right? I don't know how you record your spiritual journey, what you're learning, how you write things down, how you journal, but will you leave something behind for future generations to know a little bit of your heart, know a little bit about how you thought and how God is changing you? Write it down. Leave it behind. When you're in heaven, you won't care about what they're reading here. The Lord already knows everything about you anyway. So journal. Write it down. Record your thoughts. Record what God is teaching. It is such an honor for me to teach God's Word. That you would come this morning and sit down with your Bibles open, pen in hand, and say, feed us the Word of God is such a joy and privilege. Not only is the Word of God the standard that transforms us by the power of the Holy Spirit, changing us from the inside out, but also this, God's Word is powerful enough to save us and to sustain us. This is what every follower of Christ needs to know. The darkness that is around is increasing. Deceivers, deception, what Paul said, they're increasing. These last days, uh, no surprise here, there's going to be an increasing difficulty there will be persecution. It will continue to increase against all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. But we have a guaranteed deliverance. So we need to know that. That's what every follower of Christ needs to know. It's Discipleship 101. Welcome to life in Christ. You need to get a Bible, pray, be in fellowship. You're going to grow and there's going to be, there's going to be trials. But God is with you. And he will walk through every trial with you. Psalm 91 closes. He goes through the fire with us. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. So we need to know this. What do we need to do then? Devote ourselves to understanding the word of God and to obeying the truth of God's word. That's what we see in Psalm 37. Trust in the Lord. Delight in the Lord. Commit your way into the Lord. And wait patiently for the Lord. That's what Stephen did. And he is brought up as well in these sacred writings. And he preaches them. And God uses that to bring Saul of Tarsus to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. As we devote ourselves to the Word of God, there's some things we need to remember. Remember this. That the truth is for you. The truth is for me, but the truth isn't from you. It doesn't originate with me. I heard someone in an interview this week justifying a lifestyle contrary to Scripture. And they said, well, my truth, have you heard people say that? Well, you know, what's true for me, listen, it's either true, I know this is not, you know, contrary to public opinion right now, but it is either true or it is not true. Somebody's lying to you. They're just bold-faced lying to you. And they say, well, that's what's true for me. Yeah, but that's not true. I was there. That wasn't said. That wasn't done. What you're saying is not true. You don't just say, well, man, that was true for them. Try that on a police officer that pulls you over. Well, you know, police, police officer, I, I respect you and I appreciate you. I know you were telling me I was doing 12 over in the school zone. But, you know, my truth is I was doing 12 under. Just see how far that gets you. It doesn't work. 
Well, what's true for me is I really enjoy that other side of 94. You need to stay on eastbound or westbound, depending on which way your nose of your car is headed, because there's some truth there, and that is traffic's moving this way. If we think about this, this truth was delivered to us by someone else. Can you remember the person that brought you up, that was the first person to tell you the truth of God's word, to read to you God's word? And you know, someone was the first person on the scene in their life, and someone was on the first per scene in their life, and we passed the faith along. Somebody, were, maybe it was your parents, maybe it was a Sunday school teacher, maybe it was somebody, a, a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, took you to church, and someone was the first person on the scene in your life to tell you how bad you are, how good God is, and what he's done to rescue you. And that word just washed over you. You mean somebody's honest about my condition? I'm desperately wicked. And that same, that same being came and lived and died in my place so that I could be reconciled? Someone brought this truth to you. This is the truth that is able to make a person wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. What's Paul dealing with at the end of verse 15 there? It's the gospel. Timothy, stick to the gospel. You have to stick to Jesus. You have to preach Jesus. And it's not just Jesus from the New Testament. You ever known someone? I might know someone in a movie. Oh, got to use the bathroom. Out they go. It's like 10, 15 minutes later, come back in. Hey, what's going on? What's happened? Who's, what happened there? What happened? Like, not now. You missed that. You know, let alone if there's part one and part two of a play and somebody shows up at part two. Like, now what's this character? And why are they over there? And why is this one here? And what, like, you, you missed the first half. You've got to see the first half to understand the second half. As we preach Christ, it's Old Testament, He's concealed, and New Testament, He's revealed. All Scripture, it's every Scripture, the whole Word of God is important for the life and salvation and for us to understand and to grow Paul writes, Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, through the word of God. So we share this word. That's why we don't just hide this word. That's why in Luke 24, Jesus says, all the scriptures, Psalms, prophets, the whole Old Testament, the law, I was fulfilling all of those scriptures and now you have a responsibility. Take this word and tell everybody. Your eyewitnesses, go testify to the goodness of the Creator God in Christ. Go tell everyone. And they did. That's why we're here this morning. When John, in John chapter 6, verse 63 and 64, Jesus is saying, He's saying, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The flesh is no help at all. It's the Spirit who gives life. The words, Jesus says, that I have spoken to you are Spirit and life. And then he says this. And this is a sad note, but it's, it's true. But there are some of you who do not believe. That's perhaps true in almost every gathering of churches across the world today that people will gather and they believe. They have come to faith in Jesus. And then there are many people who gather who are religious. They know some of the, the scriptures. They went to parochial school. They've gone through all of these various things. But they don't believe. They're not spiritually alive. There are some who do not believe. That is Trust in the Lord with all their heart. Not lean on your own understanding. So, number one, why should we prioritize God's Word in our lives? Because God's Word defines and delivers us. Second reason, God's Word is divine. And it develops us. 
God's word is divine. This is an unusual book. There's no book like it. You ever, you ever see on, on TV when, I haven't seen an ad for a while, but for a while there was a real campaign from the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints, where they would send you a Bible in the Book of Mormon, right? You want a copy of the Bible? We'll come in under this banner, Bible. We love the Bible, and we'll send you the Book of Mormon. A lot of times, as, as Jehovah's Witness goes, go around, they'll use Jesus, uh, you know, the European artist rendition of Jesus on publications, but then all of their doctrine pull, de denies the deity of Christ, pulls it down. To using his appearance, using an understanding to calm down defenses, and then introduces error, that which denies the deity of Christ. God's word is divine. God's Word develops us. Scripture is breathed out by God. So here we see the power of the Word, and this is what Paul is, is uh, transmitting. He's giving to Timothy, he says, all Scripture is breathed out by God. This is the living Word. God's Word is holy. That is, it's set apart. It's consecrated for a divine purpose. Okay, so I, I had a professor in seminary and he would sign his, uh, his communication holy ones. Like he would introduce a, a, a letter of communication, holy ones, dear holy ones. That's what it means to be a saint. It doesn't mean perfect sinless ones. It means you've been set apart by God for a special purpose. You've been sanctified. And so using that term, that's what the church is. It's a gathering of believers. We're saints of God in Christ Jesus. We've been made holy. God's word is divine. God himself is holy. Therefore, his word is holy. God's word is divine because he is divine. The Bible isn't just an ordinary book because it has been breathed out by God. God has spoken clearly, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This is why sometimes people will say, um, did you talk to my spouse this last week when you were preparing that message? How did you know exactly what I was dealing with? I didn't. This is the word of God and the same spirit of God that lives in me, that inspired the writers of the scriptures, lives in you, knows you, and all of this works together to conform us to the image of Christ, to change us. Peter would write 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. In other words, the writers of Scripture, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, they didn't go sit, Paul, any of them, they didn't go sit in a room and say, I've got to think of something to say. I have got to think of something good. I want it to be on the bestsellers list. This is important. I've got to do this right. I think I'm going to, uh, no, not that. All right, I don't know how you write things, but sometimes they start out like backspace, backspace, just you know, back it up, try that again. Writing an email, sending somebody like, no, try that again. God breathed out his word. So each of these authors, their personality, it is reflected just like if I told everybody, write down your notes, write down the power of the word then if you put that on a sheet of paper, blank sheet of paper, and we spread those all out, they would all look different. They would all look differently because each of us are different and you're using a different pen. You, you have different penmanship. So the word of God, even the, the four gospels from the four different perspectives and the, this one inspiring spirit, four different human authors, and they give us different perspectives. There's no conflict. There's different perspectives that help us give a full understanding of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his ministry, his resurrection, his ascension, and our mission on earth knowing that he is with us. This word is divine, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, Peter says, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God. Oh, the Bible is precious, is it not? It's precious. I've told you before, I remember 
I had a Sunday school teacher. His name was Al Aiello, Mr. Aiello. And I think I was just a, just a little guy. And I remember, I think the only thing I remember that he ever taught us was boys, it was a boys class, don't ever set anything on top of your Bible. Let it be the top book. Like that's just one of the things. And he was just teaching like that's what he did. When he has a stack of books, he puts the Bible on the top. I don't remember anything else Mr. Aiello taught us. I remember where he lived. I remember going visiting kids in our class. I remember that one thing that he taught us in a lesson. He didn't have a verse for that anywhere. That was just something he poured out into the lives of uh, little kids, all right? How are we going to grasp the Word of God? On the screen is going to come, and uh, this is, if you picture a hand, there's really five ways. How do we grasp the Word of God? Notice, I mean, if you try to hold your Bible and you just have four, four fingers, you're missing the thumb, it's going to be a little hard. How, th- picture your, your hand grasping the Word of God. How are you going to grasp the Word of God? You have to hear the Word of God, read the Word of God, Study the Word of God, memorize the Word of God, and meditate on the Word of God. This is the process to grow in in the Scriptures. To hear it, to read it. That's why we gather uh, in small groups. We study, study on your own. You study in a community of believers, sharing what we're learning. You memorize the Word of God. Committing Scripture into your heart. You get it down in. Why? Why? You never know when you're going to need it. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to your word. You have to hide the word of God. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, 105. It's the word of God. And then you can meditate. You can be driving and you can be thinking through those scriptures. Be still and know that I am God. Lord, help me to be still and remember that you are God and it's all chaos today and traffic is stuck and there's an accident over there and a hurricane's blowing in on the coast and all of this is just chaos everywhere. So be still and know. Be reminded God is God. He's sovereign. He's good. He's in control. And I would say the way that this really begins to take another step of producing in our lives is when we share. It's one thing to take it all in, 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 in. But when you start sharing what you're learning, sharing what you're memorizing, it's when you start giving out that you become a stream instead of a pond. You're golfing yesterday. There were some pretty stagnant ponds on that that golf course. I mean, just thick with stuff on the top. I didn't go get a drink out of there. We want to be flowing streams. And when we're hearing the Word of God, reading, studying, memorizing, meditating on it, thinking on the Word of God, praying the Word, and then sharing. Hey, what are you learning? Here's what God is teaching me. Here's a verse. Man, I love this verse. And share that with somebody. What about the process of the Word? The power of the Word? The process of the Word? Every scripture, both testaments, is profitable for... And this, this is what Paul lays out for teaching... That's doctrine, the content of truth, the faith. That's what Stephen preached, doctrine, teaching. We're committed to learning and knowing all of the Bible. We will not limit ourselves like, well, the Old Testament, no. No, we want to know all of the Bible. That's why as a church, our number one distinctive, the priority of preaching, Christ-centered preaching proclaiming the authority of God's word without apology. Without apology, I'm not apologizing that we will preach Old Testament and New Testament because Christ is concealed in the old, revealed in the new. Why would we say we don't need Jesus concealed? We don't need all of that foundation. That, I want you to understand, is arrogant and that is missing the mark. To be a faithful, anyone who is in a ministry that that's their mode, they're missing the mark. And they will stand before the Lord for that. All of the scripture, every scripture is for teaching, for reproof. That's rebuking that is what is wrong. Take apart error. That's what I'm, uh, that's a reproof. That's a rebuke to say anybody, any church that says we don't want the Old Testament, th- that's a rebuke. Because the word of God rebukes that. It's all of scripture. 
It's very clear. Correction. I mean, nobody, nobody wants to be around someone that they're just constantly telling them, you're doing that wrong. You're doing that wrong. Oh, you did that wrong. Oh, you know, this is wrong, 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 wrong. There are times when we need to hear that, right? Anybody love to hear somebody say, you know, you just did that wrong. You mowed your grass wrong. Did you know you did that wrong? Oh, you did this wrong. Nobody wants to hear that at work or wherever. But would you rather someone tell you or just let you carry on if you're actually doing it wrong? But then the correction is how to get right. The word in the original language means re restoration to an upright or right state. To get back on your feet. I'll never forget the lady when we were at dinner uh, where I went to college in Springfield, Missouri. Then we got together, a big group of us, and there was a lady, and she was serving, and I was concerned. I mean, I know she was about the age of my grandmother, and she came out of the kitchen with a large order on a tray about this big filled. And she had that tray, and she had to go up a step to where we were sitting. And I remember watching her, and she's holding this tray. And I saw her, but I was stuck behind the table about from here to behind the keyboard. And she went like this, and she tried to go up, and it was too much. She didn't have the strength to do the step up. And she went, whoo, bam, that whole tray hit the floor. All of that entire, our whole food order was on the ground. And worse than that was this lady's just so embarrassed. I know she was just crushed. I know that just hurt her deeply of, oh, I let these people down and I didn't have the strength and I'm, oh, what am I doing? And, and it, my heart was broken for that lady. And they come along, they get it all, lift her back up, back on the feet. That's what the word of God, it rebukes us, it reproves us, but it corrects us. Instruction in righteousness, that's how to stay right. That word for instruction, it means training, used in training up or bringing up, rearing a child. The training of the believer is to be in righteousness, not in our own self-righteousness, but in God's pure righteousness. We grow up in righteousness as we learn, as we love, and we humbly live out God's word. That's the process. That's the process that we are all engaged in. What does this process produce? That's what I want to know. What's the product of the word? Paul here uses the title, the man of God. You, man of God. That's an Old Testament even term, man of God, a prophet. It's for the man of God, but it's for the people of God as well, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. What's the product of the word? Paul is focused in Timothy. I want you to be complete. I want you to be adequate. I, want, I don't want you to lack anything. This is a person who's mature and proficient for everything that God calls them to do. They're ready. They're complete. They're not lacking anything. They're equipped for every good work. This is a man. Timothy, you are equipped. And you will equip the saints for the work of the ministry, as it says in Ephesians 4. So just imagine a church filled with people who are complete. And they're equipped for every good work. This is the product of the word of God. That we're not saved by our works. We're saved by grace through faith. But Ephesians 2.10 says we're saved for good works. How are we going to be equipped? And you can kind of walk through this backwards. How will we ever be equipped for every good work? Well, we have to be complete. Well, how are we ever going to be complete? Well, we have to be instructed in righteousness and we have to be corrected and reproved. We have to be taught. That's the process. Well, we don't have power to do that. It comes from the Spirit. It comes from the Word. God's Word has the power. You need the power. You need the process. And then you get the product. And some of you work in companies where you understand, I have a product to produce. This is what we aim to do. What's your process? What's going to power this process to get the product? Is it machines? Is it humans? How are you? What's the process? What's the power to get the product? Well, we can't ever get the product. How much are you going to invest into that process? There's no power. How much are you going to put into that? We have all the power we need in the Word of God, the Spirit of God. There's the process laid out, and the product is that we'll be complete, and we'll be equipped for every good work. We'll be ready. That when there's a need, the people of God are ready to work out their own salvation. God's Word defines and delivers us. The, the summary will come up. Why? Why would we prioritize God's words in our, in our lives? His Word. It defines and delivers us. 
God's word is divine and develops us. This is what we, this is what we need. This is what we have in the word of God. This is why we gather week by week. We worship together. We come under the word. We walk together in community. And by God's grace, that work, that's all of us. We put our hands to the word. We're ready. I'm equipped. I'm, I'm complete. Uh, and, and it's not that I have arrived and I have everything I ever need. I have God and I have his word. His spirit is in me. So I'll swing. I'll serve and I'll trust the Lord with the outcome. Can't we praise God for his word? So my question this morning to us then is, how have you responded to God's word? And maybe this in your next step, how should we respond? What's our next step? How should we respond to God's word, knowing his word? Maybe as you think back and you, and you allow the Holy Spirit to say, okay, so are you taking in the word of God? Are you feeding on the word of God? Are you sharing the word of God? Memorizing whatever it may be. Are you loving the word of God? Praise God for his word. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for your word. And we would do well to be reminded of how good you are and how powerful and great your word is. Jesus, with one word, you calmed the storms. With one word, you raised the dead. With one word, you healed the sick. Your word changes us, Lord. If there's a person in this hour or the next that has never come to humbly receive, to receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls, James writes, then may this, may this be the day of their salvation, where humbly they turn from sin and they receive with meekness your word and you plant it like a seed you take out the heart of stone and you put in a heart of flesh you give life through your spirit by your word we thank you for this Lord we rejoice in your word we need your word so increase our hunger for your word and increase our obedience to your word for Jesus sake for his glory we pray Amen.